This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Welcome to the second morning session. We have uh, three wonderful panelists. Uh, yesterday morning uh, was uh, uh, the domain of the two Joannes. Uh, later in the day, too, we had two Jennifers. But uh, we have uh, a, a Jennifer on our panel, uh, Jennifer James. Uh, We'll follow the, pretty much uh, what uh, other uh, chairs have done. I'm not going to introduce uh, these uh, wonderful uh, panelists in great detail. Uh, uh, Jennifer James is assistant professor of English and Africana Studies at George Washington University and working on a fascinating manuscript on the relationship between representations of violence to the black body and the politics of citizenship. Now, Jean Andrew Jarrett is a phenomenon. Uh, <laughs> I have uh, wondered when he sleeps. Uh, he is assistant professor of English at the University of Maryland College Park. His uh, little bio notes about five or six projects. Uh, believe me, he's working on another 16 <laughs> at this moment. And uh, finally, we have Thomas Leuchten Muller, independent scholar and literary critic who resides in uh, Munich, but writes for the Swiss paper, New Zurich Zeitung. And uh, uh, he did his pr uh, program in theater arts at Ohio University. And I'm currently teaching in the theater of Ohio University. So we have uh, something common and I've enjoyed hospitality in his home country many times. Uh, uh, during Q and A, uh, I will give preference to people that I cannot see behind these pillars. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, without further ado, Jennifer James. Good morning. I am one of the three Jennifers, and coincidentally, we're all working on Dunbar and the Civil War, and we're going to break away and form our own society. <laughs> so, this will be the last you're seeing of us. <laughs> Okay, so, at the turn of the century, Dunbar published two novels, The Uncalled in 1898 and The Love of Landry in 1900. Though quite different in subject matter, both novels center on white protagonists and both were published to generally unfavorable reviews. Undeterred, in 1901, he published yet another. Set in the town of Durbury, Ohio, a fictionalized representation of Dayton, the Fanatics follows three white families ripped apart over political differences raised by the Civil War, taking the theme of a house divided and rendering it in dizzying triplicate. The one black who can be considered a character in the novel, the town crier, Nigger Ed, called Nigger Ed by the townspeople and the narrator, is ridiculed as a degenerate until after he joins the war, nursing the dying and wounded of Durbury. Nigger Ed is then welcomed into the community. At the close of the conflict, all families reconcile, recognizing the unnecessary price all paid for their fanaticism. From this synopsis alone, it may appear that Dunbar has abandoned his novel to the narrative pleasures of an unrestrained sentimentality. Certainly, Dunbar's novelistic landscape, strewn with broken homes and fractured relationships, seems a bit crowded, even by the genre standards. Many of the more recent assessments of the novel, written a good decade before the critical recuperation of sentimental literature in the 1980s, describe it as an inartistic work attributing the failure of the novel to Dunbar's reliance on minstrel caricature 
excuse me, reliance on minstrel caricature to construct nigger ed and his quote unquote anachronistic use of sentimentalism, noting that the fanatics was written after the advent of mimetic or documentary, documentary realism in American literature. However, I will argue that a more nuanced reading of Dunbar's novel can be generated by examining, at, examining it as a work that intentionally places itself in conversation with a particular genre of American sentimentalist war writing that flooded the marketplace in the decades following the war, the reconciliation narrative, produced by both northern and southern writers. Virtually bereft of any of the markers of realism, these narratives acted as powerful cultural counterparts to a national movement toward post-war reconciliation, promoting themes of sectional reunion and purposefully downplaying the differences, particularly those pertaining to racial matters that drove the South to succeed from the North and that subsequently drove the nation to war. As a response to this genre, the fanatics should be read as a novel arising from Dunbar's awareness that the forgetting necessary for interregional healing depended on an unspoken but definite understanding that black political progress would be hindered in the process. Dunbar essentially agrees then with the reconciliations excuse me, reconciliationist interpretation of the conflict, depicting the war as a simple misunderstanding between northerners and southerners. He implies that when the war ended and these passions cooled, these misunderstandings were quickly cast aside so that the nation could get on with the real national business, finding ways to keep blacks in a permanently subjugated position. Interpreted in this context, the use of anachronistic forms and figures can be interpreted as Dunbar's self-conscious assertion of a black political and historical realism. I will suggest that within this excuse me, reconceptualization of realism, both sentimentalism and menstrual characterization are made to operate allegorically. For instance, sentimentalism's romanticized endings in which fractured bonds are quickly healed at the expense of more complex resolutions are typically discussed as creating literary imaginaries that attempt to correct the social and political deficiencies of the real world. However, Dunbar's repetition of these endings in The Fanatics suggests that he views these tidied, hurried literary closures as paralleling a quite real and devastating political impulse in the post-war nation. Similarly, Dunbar's decision to configure nigger ed as a minstrel represents the way black men's place in the white national home is secured, Dunbar suggests, by a performative dissembling, the ability to rescind any self-determining manhood earned in the military and repeat the dominant culture's narratives of the war. Critics have thus missed an important point. In Dunbar's Civil War novel, the medium is the message. Nearly immediately, in fact, the writer calls attention to a defining convention of sentimentalism, the, uh, the use of melodrama. Of one discussion taking place among the white characters, the narrator offers this wry comment. It was a strange scene for these self-contained people who thought so little of their emotions, but their fervor gave a melodramatic touch to all they did that at another time must have appeared ridiculous. And noting the fervor that gives a melodramatic touch to what the people of Durbury did, what they did, of course, is lend emotional fuel to the war. And by asking the reader to consider how this heightened state of uh, emotion would have appeared at another time, and by denaturalizing the effusions of these people who thought so little of their emotions normally, the writer reveals an artifice in the sentiment that prompted the characters to take side in the conflict. This revelation threatens to undo the artifice of Dunbar's novel itself, and ultimately the artifice of the entire Civil War. After all, the logic of 19th century literary melodrama demands polarization, finding its purpose in positing a morally instructive universe predicated on a conviction that binaries, right and wrong, good and bad, do exist, and most importantly, are actual forces in the world. One must overcome the other. No synthesis emerges from the attention created by the two. The middle, as Peter Brooks explains it, remains expressly excluded. However, the major assertion white reconciliation novels make, that the war was more of a momentary lapse in a profound political conflict, transgresses the very logic they invoke. Accordingly, Dunbar's novel suggests that melodramatic sentiment, fanaticism, is not a pedagogical tool pointed to right and wrong within a morally instructive universe. It merely appears to operate that way within a universe that is morally inert. There is neither good nor bad, nor 
no union versus Confederate, no abolitionist versus slaveholder. There was, an, there was only and always the excluded middle, a space that excludes, of course, black Americans. Nigger Ed is the embodiment of this exclusion. The town drunkard, the bell ringer, Ed skirts around the narrative edges of the novel, appearing only periodically, and then as a disruptive figure, creating confusion, consternation, or laughter wherever he appears. He is a stock plantation darkie, but free, urban, and living in the Midwest. Dunbar offers a description of Ed early in the novel. The servant is always curious, the Negro servant particularly so, and to the Negro, the very atmosphere of this silent house, the constrained attitude of the family were pregnant with mystery. Ed had a picturesque knack for lying, and the tale that resulted from his speculations was a fabric worthy of his weaver. Picturesque, blundering, gossipy. For writers of plantation fiction, the comic darkie was, of course, a useful creation. This manner of literary containment in pre-war plantation fiction offered a much needed relief from the incriminations and implications of miscegenation. But of equal importance, containment also reduced anxiety stemming from the very real threat of a discontented slave population that mounted hundreds of rebellions, many bloody, against the whites who oppressed them. It is no surprise, then, that during the war, popular Southern fiction attempted to diminish the threat of black service by making African-American soldiers into sambos. As Alice Faw has noted, Southern writers, quote, imagined black men refusing to fight, kidnapped by Yankees, and always eager to belong to somebody, end quote. In post-war reconciliation literature, such as Thomas Dixon's The Klansman, the darkie was used to paint a picture of free men as hapless and lazy watermelon eaters, unfit for, excuse me, unfit for the franchise. It is significant, then, that Dunbar takes this figure and makes him the sole representative of black military service in the novel. However, Dunbar does not have nigger Ed enlist as a soldier, but has him enter into the army as an officer servant, and then he becomes a nurse. Before the Civil War, Frederick Douglass had predicted that black service would certainly secure the black men's rights, excuse me, secure the black man's rights. Somewhat differently, later, abolitionist Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who commanded the first African-American reg regiment officially raised for the Civil War, issued this progress report on his black subordinates. They were, quote, growing more like white men, less grotesque, end quote. Yet another white soldier commented, with friends like these, right? <laughs> Yet another white soldier commented, quote, put a United States uniform on his back and the chattel is a man, end quote. Documents of African-American military service abound with before and after photographs of black soldiers attesting to this alleged racial and corporeal rehabilitation. And I have a um, photograph, uh, an image of, this is the most famous, and many people have seen this image of Gordon, um, um, the contraband slave, but it's, it's typically reproduced in isolation, but as part of this triptych of, of images, we see that he goes from the, so the racial degraded um, slave into the, the reformed or rehabilitated and disciplined, um, I guess, Anglo model of manhood signified by the uniform, so. Okay, so, you, you can, um, can you, you can, you can drop that image now, thanks. Okay. Um, okay, so yet when Dunbar writes a new cap, when Dunbar writes, quote, a new cap and a soldier's belt had their effect on Ed, and he marched upon his writers, very stern, dignified, and erect, end quote, Ed elicits, quote, a burst of laughter, end quote. The, t the town still refuses to recognize the black manhood that military service has promised. Quote, the people greeted him in more serious tones, as if his association with their soldiers, light though it had been, had brought him nearer to the manhood which they, had still, which they still refused to recognize in him, end quote. In this passage, Dunbar exposes the profound ambivalence many Northerners had about the meaning of black military participation. While much of Northern literature published after blacks formerly conscripted often celebrated service as the arrival of this manhood and of interracial fraternity, as, Fa as Fawes further notes, much of it also attempted to, quote, sharply limit the implication, oh my goodness, uh, uh, no, okay, by killing off black heroes, imagining white control of black actions, and by ridicule, 
the town in part laughs because the culture has instructed it to do so. The narrator of the fa fanatics echoes the town's ambivalence about Ed's new status. What he felt is hardly worth recording. He was so near the animal in the estimation of his fellows, perhaps too near in reality, that he could be assumed to have uh, really few mental impressions. They had kicked a dog and the dog had gone away. That was all. Yet Ed was not all the dog. His feeling was that of a child who has tried to be good and then has been misunderstood. In allowing the text's authoritative objective voice to assess Ed both psychologically and biologically, Dunbar demonstrates how the dominant culture's narratives will silence black voice to read and transcribe the black body as it sees fits. Ed's manhood, ostensibly established through service, will be rescinded as he's demoted to an animal and infant. In 1898, Dunbar penned Recession Never, a fiery essay in reaction to the Wilmington uh, riots, expressing outrage over the violent tactics used to expel blacks from the political process. He argues that the problem is not limited to the South. Quote, the race spirit in the United States is not local but general. The new attitude may be interpreted as saying, Negroes, you may fight for us, but you may not vote for us. End quote. He continues, 30 years ago, the American people told the Negro that he was a man with a full man's powers. They deemed it that important that they did what they had done few times in the history of the country. They wrote it down in their constitution. And now they come with the shotgun in the South and sophistry in the North to prove to him that it was all wrong, end quote. Dunbar sees the force, forces gathering against black enfranchisement as hypocrisy, quote, we are presented with the spectacle of people gushing through glowing headlines over the bravery of its black heroes. In an incredibly short space of time, almost too brief it would seem for the mental transition of the individual, much less uh, the nation, we found mouthpieces of the same people chronicling the Connor Kling, excuse me, the armed resistance to the Negroes and the exercise of those powers and privileges for which the colored men fought. The drama of this sudden change of heart is incongruous to the point of ghastly humor. The rapid shift in feeling happened far too quickly for the gushing to have been genuine. Yet another statement Dunbar makes about the transitory nature of melodramatic sentiment and the artifice of politics shaped by that sentiment. By the time Dunbar f published The Fanatics, any residual doubt he harbored about the utter failure of black military participation to secure manhood rights had become solidified. The trick the town Durbury will need to pull off, indeed the trick the nation will need to pull off, will be to keep um, Ed the man in the demasculinized position Ed the, Ed the nigger occupied before the war. However, Ed's new body no longer fits the older pre-war pro-slavery narratives that could sentimental, excuse me, sentimentalize the body in its safely bound state. This trick then will be a discursive one, finding an alternative discourse that will accommodate Ed's transition into post-war narratives without actually elevating his degraded status. This course, Ed's future in the new nation will take, is exemplified in one of the occupations that helps Ed increase his post-war fortunes, storyteller. There, excuse, Quote, there were, Dunbar writes, women who begged him to come in and talk about their sons who had been left on the southern field, wives who had wanted to hear over and over the last words of their loved ones, end quote. One minute, right? Okay. This job has been filled before, for instance, by Sam, the narrator of Mars Chan's Confederate glory, and by Uncle Remus's Uncle Remus and Harris is the story of the war. Post-war Southern ne reconciliation narratives, excuse me, post-war Southern nationalist fiction did more than allow the nationalist writers to narrate blacks as they wanted, but in a greater exercise of power, they could force blacks to tell the same stories that they did. In The Klansman, but Ben the Southerner first falls for the Northerner elite, Elsie, when she picks up a banjo and sings in black dialect. It is not so much Elsie that mesmerizes him, but her channeling of the Southern plantation black. No Yankee girl could play or sing these songs, he exclaims. The darky voice, called soft by Dixon, is indeed music to the ear when the grating sounds of black political protests are muffled beneath the soothing tones of white nostalgia. Dunbar's 1903 poem, Unsung Heroes, calls for a singer to sing a song of Civil War soldiers that would, quote, make hate of race grow obsolete and cold. Within this poem, Dunbar recognizes that a different voice was needed for this role. The seer would replace the minstrels of old. Ed will not be this, that voice. No longer considered the town buffoon at the end of the narrative, he becomes the town met, mascot, petted and spoiled, very much like the dog the narrator labeled him in earlier. You belong to Durbury, a character notes. Um, uh, I beg your pardon? 30 seconds. 30 seconds, okay. Um, okay. 
Okay, let's see. The value of Dunbar's bleak, ver ver <laughs> bleak version of the outcome of black military participation is clarified when set, ag set against valorizing portrayals offered by such writers as Francis Harper. Writing of the psychic aftermath of the Holocaust, Jack Kukulmas suggests that refusing the more, more troubling aspects of the past, quote, robs history of its critical power to disturb. Dunbar wanted to, to disturb. As a man whose father served in the Civil War with little tangible award, it would be unlikely that he would desire anything less. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs>I would say good morning, but I need the time. <laughs> Don't mind me. Local color and literary realism, as William Dean Howells so defined them, could not account entirely for the moral and thematic complexity of Paul Lawrence Dunbar's first novel, The Uncalled. The novel traces Fred Brent's development from the mean streets of a provincial town in Ohio called Dexter to his temporary experimentation with Methodism, then to his secular enlightenment in Cincinnati. In these cultural geographies appear the relationship between human development and the environment at deep spiritual levels often left unexplored by, by either local color or realism. In a letter from London to his fiancée, Alice Ruth Moore, Dunbar discusses his first novel in these terms as he's writing it, quote, My novel grows apace, though I can hardly call that a novel which is merely the putting together of half a dozen distinct characters and letting them work out their destiny along the commonplace lines suggested by their values and environment. While echoing the prevailing realistic discourse of the commonplace, Dunbar advanced beyond this paradigm by participating in a generational shift resisting this discourse. A year or two before Dunbar wrote The Uncalled, members of American Literary Society were recognizing this generational shift. In an interview with Howells in 1894, Stephen Crane recognized such a change in the literary pulse of the country within the last four months, a counterwave, a flood of the other, a reaction in fact. Trivial, temporary perhaps, but a reaction certainly. Howells agreed. He says, what you say is true. I've seen it coming. I suppose we shall have to wait. Here, the other implies Frank Norris, actually, considered the forefather of American literary naturalism, and above Crane and Hamlin Garland, one of the preeminent critics of Howellsian realism and its high aesthetic decorum. In this paper, I'll argue that Dunbar's novel complicates the kind of literary realism then associated with Anglo-American literature. The novel does so by addressing such ideas as spirituality, heritage, destiny, and the environment in ways that contradict Howells' own protocols for literary verisimilitude, namely simplicity, naturalness, and honesty. In several ways, the novel anticipates the naturalism of Frank Norris, an Anglo-American writer that called for profound literary forays into the minds and hearts of the lower and marginal classes. This paper is, large, is part of a larger argument which I flesh out in my forthcoming book, Deans and Truants. This book argues that bookstores, libraries, and higher education have perpetuated the idea that African American literature must be authentic or written by and about black people. Promoted by de facto deans of literary schools since the late 19th century, this popular idea has long obscured the history of black authors, even some of the most canonical, who were not just interested in writing literature about their race. Such authors play truant from literary schools of racial realism by writing fiction with unconventional characters and genres. One literary exchange, so to speak, occurs between Howells and Dunbar. Elsewhere in journal articles, I've argued two things. First, Howells subscribed to the racialism of blackface minstrelsy performed by whites, which created a cultural precondition for minstrel realism in African American literature. Minstrel realism is a term I use to define a postbellum phenomenon in which audiences regarded the romance and sentimentality of black minstrelsy, which is different from blackface minstrelsy, because black minstrelsy was performed by blacks, as racially authentic and realistic. Secondly, Dunbar, an admitted racial uplift ideologue, resisted minstrel representations of the folk in the uncalled, not only by avoiding such minstrel characterizations, but also by incorporating class and regional markers of realism. In this paper, I extend this reading. In my continuing reluctance to, to view the uncalled as a novel simply without black characters, I suggest that we should interpret the novel in paradigmatic terms that extend beyond the racial identity of characters. We must think about how the uncalled, as Shelley Fishkin puts elsewhere about similar literature, transgresses or violates the norms of genre, 
which here comprise certain historically relative principles of literary form, style, or intention. For me, the genre transgressed is not only minstrel realism mentioned before, but literary realism as well in the traditional sense of the term. I want to make a case that Dunbar was a naturalist. He adopted or adapted literary naturalism to convey human difference and a profoundly spiritual story. But he was a special kind of naturalist writer. Indeed, unlike Frank Norris's version of literary naturalism, the uncalled revises the conventional masculinist plot of decline. Jen Fleischner has described this plot as a fatalistic depiction of modern individuals as bereft of agency or vitality, dwarfed by a cityscape of soulless mechanical dynamos, and thus as ultimately tragic. By contrast, Dunbar's novel illustrates the importance of individual will to overcoming environmental forces, even within the city. It shows how Fred Brent could ultimately embrace modern civilization, not in spite of, but ultimately because of a respect for women in his life. At the turn of the 20th century, women had come to symbolize in life and literature the strained relationship between men and modernity, It has been shown in recent scholarship. Notwithstanding the biographical details of his own marriage to Alice Ruth Moore, Dunbar, to an extent, alleviates this tension in the uncalled through remarkable discourses of human interiority. In brief, literary naturalism did not discriminate among cultural geographic settings. At the turn of the 20th century, however, amid the circumstances of modernization, urban settings did pervade naturalist stories. Within these stories, literary characters confront the demise of individualism in the face of hereditary and environmental determinism. The preponderance of literary characters serving as human subjects explains the titles of naturalist stories, which often highlight simply the name, tra traits, or trials of the protagonist. For example, telling the story of Fred Brent's defiance of Dexter's norms and its imagination of his calling, which, is, which explains the title of the novel, The Uncalled, functions in terms of Dunbar's own literary experimentation with the norms of naturalism. Naturalist protagonists rarely control internal or external forces, just as they rarely narrate the nature and implications of these forces in the first person. More often, third person omniscient narration guides the reader through these stories, often verging on blatant didacticism, as opposed to the putatively more detached, objective, or repertorial kind of realism. The formal properties of the uncalled suggest that prior to Norris and later Theodore Dreiser, Dunbar was already experimenting with literary ways of stretching realism in new directions. Howells would have disapproved of this, uh, this attempt. In the New York Times interview with Crane three years after the release of Howells' book Criticism and Fiction, Howells admonished that a novel should never preach and berate and storm. Ineffably tiresome, this kind of novel neglects the more important business to picture the daily life of the most, in the most exact terms possible with an absolute and clear sense of proportion. Book reviewers likewise criticize the uncall for displaying unrealistic incidents and for its intrusively didactic narration, some of the hallmark problems critics have then and since recognized in American naturalist fiction. These critics tended to reiterate Howells' guidelines for realist writing, drama, economic characterization, sparing prose, and streamlined exposition. They also questioned the overly philosophical nature of the novel's portrayal of spirituality, heritage, destiny, and the environment. But these are the very parameters Dunbar needed to tell the story of Fred Brent. In a letter to Alice Ruth Moore, Dunbar revealed that he was not opposed to literary philosophizing, and I quote, I believe that a story is a story and try to make my characters real life people, but I also believe that characters in fiction should be what men and women are in real life, the embodiment of a principle or an idea. By balancing local color, literary realism, and natural, naturalist principles, the Uncall examines with considerable depth Fred's rise from the mean streets, as it were. Fred's individualistic grappling with determinism constitutes the kind of naturalist story that Howells attributed to Stephen Crane and Norse upon their deaths in 1900 and 1902. Speaking of Crane's Maggie, a girl of the streets, and Norse's, Norse's McTeague, Howells once praised the two men in much the same way that a sympathetic snob would, for becoming second generation realists, in his words, who explored the tragically squalid and the grotesquely shabby streets of the modern city and the half-savage life existing there. But what about Dunbar? Indeed, Dunbar's novel describes in vivid detail Fred's ascent from Dexter's mean streets. The book also tracks the young man's encounter 
with desolation in Cincinnati upon fleeing his hometown. While searching for a boarding house in the city, Fred observes drunken adults and impoverished children lining the streets. Such images horrify Fred, whose own family history in the eyes of Dexter residents predestined him for this tragic way of life. Fred's mother, Margaret, had been a housewife stigmatized for living in the dilapidated lower class section of Dexter and for marrying an abusive and often inebriated husband, Tom Brent. As an adolescent, Fred has suffered through the divorce of his parents, the death of his mother, and the flight of his father. In Cincinnati, Fred thus seems on the verge of becoming like his unenviable father. Indeed, Fred muses in the novel, quote, is it fate, God, or the devil that pursues me so? Dexter has equated Fred's inheritance of familial blood with the inheritance of shameful parental morals and values. In determining Fred's fate by interpreting his blood, however, Dexter has also performed a self-fulfilling self prophecy. The town always has the potential of willing this fate into reality by rumoring that the Brents undermine the town's ethical standards. Ultimately, Fred demonstrates a will to overcome his fate despite the curse of his family. Mr. Tom Brent, upon returning to Dexter to make amends with his son and wife, becomes sick. He didn't know that his wife had died. Fred learns of this and returns to Dexter. On his deathbed, Mr. Brent repents before his son. At this final moment, after Fred accuses Mr. Brent of ruining his life and leaving him a, quote, heritage of shame and evil, the son forgives the father. Fred then returns to Cincinnati where he tries to clarify his relationship with God by attending a congregational church and working in the name of poor humanity. He commits himself to moral autodidacticism, but it is, but it is a self-regeneration not entirely in biblical terms, and I quote here, I've been to a better school than the Bible seminary. I haven't got many religious rules and formulas, but I'm trying to live straight and do what is right, close quote. The sign of Fred's liberation from tradition, religion, and history, and his settlement in the civiliz civilization of Cincinnati is his newfound joy in having a girlfriend coincidentally, or perhaps ironically, named Alice, who fulfills his life with happiness and emotional security. She enables Fred to consummate the detachment from Dexter for which his forgiveness of his dying father served as the penultimate step. The novel's ending defies the conventional closure of the naturalist novel with the protagonist's animalistic decline and degeneration into a tragic figure. Fred's appreciation of Alice turns the uncall from a life from a novel of tragedy into one of triumph, while reminding us that time will tell whether such triumph will remain as Fred continues to navigate his way mentally through the memories of loss and pain and physically through the unpredict unpredictable terrains of modern life. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm very thankful and honored and proud to be here at this conference on Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Paul Lawrence Dunbar is mainly known, as you know, as a poet. And scholarship has practically neglected the importance of the author as a playwright. But this is no surprise since Dunbar, Dunbar's most elaborated known play, Herrick, had been located by Herbert Woodward Martin as late as 1993 before it was published in 2002. It is the intention of this paper to show the historical theatrical context of the drama and to examine very briefly relevant aspects concerning content, form, and the writer's life. The end of the 19th century was a busy period in the history of the African American theater. This is valid especially for the scene's heart, New York. Take the year 1898, for instance. This was a point in time that a trip to Coontown opened at the Third Avenue Theater. Coontown was the first show that was uh, exclusively organized, written, produced, and managed by blacks. Apart from it, apart from that, it is considered the first completely non-minstrel and the first musical show with an overall plot that carries the cast of characters from beginning to end. 1898 was also the year when another group of talented black Americans presented the short musical play Clorindy, The Origin of the Cakewalk, at the Casino Roof Garden. The music was composed, composed by Will Marion Cook, and the star was Ernest Hogan, a well-known black comedian. Finally, 1898 was a year in which an artist, 
who provided the lyrics for, for Clorindy, wrote a piece that was never produced. I'm talking about Paul Lawrence Damba and his drama, Herrick. In a term when the black musical show, whose period lasted from about 1890 to 1916, celebrated tremendous success and made new names famous, among them the comedians Williams and Walker, a man in his mid-twenties from Dayton, Ohio, had already demonstrated that he was an outstanding writer. And Dumba was up to something new. A serious play in standard English, based loosely on the life of poet Robert Herrick, as Martin M. Primo note. What is the drama Herrick about? Dumba called it an imaginative comedy in three acts and actually wrote it in the form and style of an 18th century English comedy of manner. He puts Bob Herrick's efforts to woo the Lady Cynthia into the center. Complications arise since Cynthia's father, Sir Peter Temple, and well of suitors conspire against Herrick. Cynthia's aunt Lucinda believes that Herrick loves her. The hero must fight against two robbers, and Cynthia herself is somehow reluctant. After Herrick has proven that he's not only a man of words, but a man of courage, bravery, and action, there's a happy end which discloses the flaws, bad intentions, and steps of the protagonist's opponents. The piece mainly takes place in the hall of Sir Peter Temple's house in Devonshire. Another important site is a lonely road with a forest bordering on it. Many details, like the coach used, indicate the time, the 18th century. Well, what's striking? What's striking is, first of all, the language that differs much from Dumbo's plantation scenes and angry protest poems. Being aware of his strength, the author is smart enough not only to choose a poet as his title hero, but also to create moments in which Herrick's fine lines rarely appear too artificial. Of importance is the poem to Cynthia, which ends with the words, quote, Thou art my life, my love, my heart, the very eyes of me, and has command of every part to live and die for thee, unquote. From other unnamed verses, I quote the beginning. How smilingly the sun looks on the earth. Methinks he's glad that Cynthia lives, glad with the gladness that I feel when here alone I do unbear my bro and know the joy that she doth breathe the same perfumed air, which laves my bro with its caressing touch. Ah, Cynthia, tis thy breath perfumes the air." Unquote. The words you see are sweet but never mawkish. Dumba's ability to play with the English language is also perfect to show, I feel, to show the extraordinary which English women and men, including intellectuals like Herrick, are traditionally known for. When Mr. Playfair sees a rival arriving, for instance, he describes him as too young, I quote, too young to be the dotard that he uh, is, too old to be the clownish fool he looks, unquote. Connected with that, Dumba depicts how he could master dialogue that characterizes a dramatis personae and propels the action. For example, when Herrick says to Sir Peter Temple and his rival suitors, quote, you pause as though my name were lady on your tongue, unquote, one Sir uh, Hastings replies, I have five minutes, no. Uh, <laughs> so, so great a man must think his name on all men's tongues. Um, You're done with right and when the suitor, Mr. Weatheridge, asks Cynthia why he's unfortunate, she says, for hadst thou come the last, who hadst been the last refused. Although the, uh, the plot is quite simple, with the robber's section as the most surprising one, Dumba is able to develop many funny and ironic situations. For those he employs, I feel, three classic devices. First, he manages to let the reader or the audience know more than the figures. Apart from the easiest way to do this, to have them speak aside, he makes sure that we see through the characters' misunderstandings. Thus, it can be that Herrick believes Lucinda knows his secret, which is that Cynthia and he are no, uh, more or less already a couple, whereas we, the readers, know that she's referring to something else, which is that Lucinda thinks Herrick is in love with her, Lucinda. Another misunderstanding concerns Sir Peter's assumption that the masked robbers who, as he says, come at last, 
are its co-conspirators, whereas we are aware of the fact that they are really robbers. A further means to create funny moments is a combination of exaggeration and the right repetition. The most effective examples of this we find in Act 2 when Cynthia says, quote, the chair does hurt my back, followed by the stage directions, they all, that means chiefly the suitors, spring to set the chair aright. Shortly after this, the lady apparently drops her skein of silk and, quote, they get down to search for it, unquote. In addition, after Cynthia complains, the frames not setting right, I cannot work this way, we read, they spring to set it right. Finally, I think one might laugh at the behavior of people that stands in sharp contrast to the obvious situation. One example of this concerns the seconds following the fight with the robbers when one of the criminal concedes that he belongs to the notorious gang of Dick Turpins, upon which Cynthia is shocked. She says, Turpin, ugh. <laughs> or ugh, I don't know how to pronounce. <laughs> but uh, Cynthia reacts by saying, how very romantic, <laughs> unquote, unquote. The play Herrick is remarkable, I feel, for two other reasons. First, it was unusual for a black intellectual of the time to create a dramatic work that does not cover black subjects and black people. Second, it is a source for Dumbo's ideas and ideals with regard to being a poet. Minor characters transport typical prejudices. Playfair, for instance, believes that poets have moods, you know, unquote. And Sir Hastings, artist on Herrick, the hero of our idle hours, I quote, who twangs his loot and ladies bowers. His only pride is to be strong, his only strength lies in a song, unquote. Herrick, however, verifies that he is a multi-leveled modern personality, like Dumba. He admits some vulnerability. He says, poets have not hearts, nor heads too strong, unquote. But as a matter of fact, he is a successful fighter, and he's clever. For example, in order to avoid the drunkenness his rival suitors have in mind for him, Herrick, I quote the stage directions, quickly pours his wine upon the floor, unquote. The hero is what Dunbar can be viewed, a poet of his people. Thus, the subtitle, as you know, of Benjamin Brawley's biography, not an unworldly individual. To what extent does the author follow the format of the comedy of manners? In which ways does he dissociate himself from the conventions? Put simply, the comedy of manners reflects the life standards and standards and life, sorry, reflects the life standards and manners of upper class society in a way that is essentially true to its traditions and philosophy. The players, I think, must strive to maintain the mask of social artifice whilst revealing to the audience what lies behind such manners. The genre is primarily marked by a flamboyant display of witty, blunt sexual dialogue, boudoir intrigues, sensual innuendos, rakish behavior, and one-dimensional characters often caricatured by their name. To be short, Dumba harmonizes with the format in many respects, for example, by calling a gentleman who behaves fair Mr. Playfair. On the other hand, the gentlemen are reserved Excuse the disputes are reserved, and you can feel how the writer intends to be realistic by ignoring, ignoring patterns of the model. There are no prologues and epilogues, and at the beginning or at the end, there are no special sections such as poetry, which might be delivered in a hilarious fashion. Yet, Herrick's last few lines rhyme. Besides, there's no indication that highly graceful, elegant ways of movement are encouraged. And gesticulation, as well as an entire array of facial grimacing, winking and smiling, are not significant. What about biographical aspects? In the brief introduction to the dramatic pieces, the editors Martin and Primor assure that Dumba, quote, no doubt wrote the play while he was in England, and therefore within a month of marrying Alice Moore. Her family was among the social elite in New Orleans and may have looked down on the self-made Dumba who had worked as an elevator operator in, in a Dayton office building. The real Robert Herrick was not to the manor born either, and achievement through hard work was for Dumba kind of personal theme. I think there are some details here to scrutinize or to add. First, while there is no doubt that Dumba wanted to impress others, we know the poet came home from England 
a bona fide African-American hero. In October 1897, he got a prestigious white collar job for a man of color as page at the Library of Congress. With his regular income, royalties, public reading fees, and money from literature sold to magazine, magazines, Dunbar was a man with a decent income. Furthermore, it was the writer's mother, Matilda, who objected to the marriage since she feared for economic well-being and selfishly protected her source of income. Plus, Alice and Paul were totally determined to get married and did finally so in secret, but without fairy tale underpinnings. They loved because of Alice's distrust of Paul, her fear that he was not truly committed to her. She fretted constantly that he would desert her and marry someone else. Both believed and hoped marriage would change him, him who has let us unveil, had raped her, with the consequence that she had sustained internal injuries requiring months of recuperations. Things Dumba might have had in mind, I think, could embrace his intention to show that a poet like Herrick and he himself, who are sad to enjoy drinks, indeed are no drunkards, and his plan to display that a quite intensive premarital relationship like Herrick's and Cynthia's, as well as, as, well as Alice's and his, which Dumba made known, are nothing reprehensible and still may or just lead to happiness. The other aspect to have a look at affects the authentic Robert Herrick, who lived from 1591 to 1674. As a matter of fact, he was born as a son of a prosperous goldsmith, yet his father committed suicide and the artist was repeatedly reduced to great straits. Among his many poems, we find four that not he not only wrote on a Julia, but explicitly called to Julia, as fictional Herrick produced a poem to Cynthia, as I said. However, there are no great similarities, except one section. Is that the historical Herrick writes, quote, permit me, Julia, now to go away, or by thy love, decree me here to stay. If thou wilt say that I shall live with thee, here shall my endless tabernacle be. If not as banished, I will live alone, unquote. And Dumba formulates, bid that heart stay and it will stay to honor thy decree, or bid it languish quite away and it shall do so for thee. In this connection, it is, unquote, not relevant um, that the real Herrick remained unmarried and habitually congratulated himself on his freedom from the yoke matrimonial, often imagined a lover. But what is important and sets him apart from Dumbas' invention are the frequent references to very specific parts of the female body. To be found in poems like Upon Julia's Breasts and Upon the Nipples of Julia's Breast. Let me end with suggestions for future research. An investigation of Herrick could include analysis of the drama fragments The Gambler's Wife, written as early as 1890, and the undated The Island of Tanawana. The Gambler's Wife is about a family whose fortune depends upon chance. The island of Tanawana, set far away, is considered, oh, excuse me, is considered uh, centered around the themes of wealth and interracial romance. In short, Damba, the dramatist, has yet to be discovered. We are still at the beginning. Thanks for listening. Well, we have had three wonderful papers. I, I was, uh, didn't mean to be flip in introducing uh, uh, Jean Jarrett. I think you can see from some of what he presented that uh, he's doing uh, very important work. In fact, some of the work he's doing, I, uh, is this anthology is about to come out that he didn't mention from NYU Press, uh, African-American literature beyond race. This. Uh, these notions of authenticity that have been constructed in relation to African-American writing. If African-American writers did not write about race, then they were not authentic African-American writers. And I think he is uh, putting a huge uh, you know, question mark next to that idea. And I think we'll see the reverberations of his work in the next uh, decade or so. Because one of the themes I'm picking up, if I may take those two minutes, he, uh, allowed me uh, <laughs> from his paper is uh, how, especially throughout Afri Afri the African-American literary tradition, but particularly from late 19th century to the 30s, how, uh, you know, the culture, uh, 
uh, white uh, friends, white patrons, uh, literary agents, publishers kind of nudged, uh, even coerced African-American writers to write in particular ways uh, instead of the way they wanted to write. And that's, I think, uh, been a kind of subtext. Uh, uh, it, it was a, not particularly a subtext in Jean's comments and in uh, Reynolds' comment in the previous panel. Uh, and uh, this is, you know, working on Harlem Renaissance. I mean, probably we wouldn't have 30% of the novels we associate with Harlem Renaissance without uh, Colvin Vecton's interventions. But on the other hand, we do not know what kind of novels we have had without his intervention and without the influence of Nigger Heaven and without his literary aesthetic. On the other hand, we wouldn't have James Weldon Johnson collection <laughs> without his uh, hard work and dedication, which is the foundation of most of the literary biography and criticism we have done in the last 30 years. So questions for the panel? Y yes, please. Kenneth Warren. Uh, this is for, uh, for Jean. Um, I'm wondering what relationship, or how you describe the relationship between the uncalled and sport of the gods from, from the respect of uh, naturalism. Um, because the latter seems to me to be the more obvious place to go when you think of Dunbar, the naturalist. Yeah, that's good. Um, the uncalled is the um, popular novel that people tend to turn when they want to think about Dunbar as a novelist. Um, and Indeed, it's justifiable because uh, it's a very important work in terms of African American literary history. But in the process, we kind of forget that Dunbar published three other novels before then, and that some of the exper experimentations performed in *The Sport of the Gods* actually um, appeared, or was you know, were practiced in the, the earliest novels. Now, I want to talk about. Uh, the sport of the gods, not only in terms of, let's say, the paradigm of naturalism and the uncalled, but you can also link it to his discussions of the tenderloin or the denizens that you often see in his essays. Because within these essays, you see his discussions of the cityscape of African Americans within these spaces and potentially the corruption of the city uh, in the, within the quote unquote um, African American soul. And so, in many respects, the uncalled kind of works with that paradigm where it says that um, the, you know, the country is good and the city is bad. But at the same time, he kind of undermines that because he does point to the levels of hypocrisy and contradictions at work within the city of Dexter. And at the same time, he talks about, to a certain extent, the redemption of Fred within the city, despite that landscape. And I would say that, in many respects, in the sport of the gods, with the movement from the south to the north, as if you look at it as a kind of migration novel, that there are these kinds of discussions of what happens to African Americans when they're in the urban environment. And this is definitely a kind of theme that persists not only within the uncalled and throughout, not in the uncalled, but in the sport of the gods, but also in his short stories. Joanne Gavin. Um, Jennifer, um, you talked about nigger, Jim, nigger, Jim, nigger Ed, mm -hmm. and as the embodiment of uh, exclusion as you uh -huh. began. And then at the end, you said that he was more the embodiment of inclusion. Uh, I want to know, how do you feel about his image at the end of the, the novel? Is he really? the embodiment of Booker T. Washington, Booker T. Washington's um, indispensable black, or is he something more subversive? You know, I'm thinking about uh, Booker T. Washington's appeal to this kind of uh, retrogressive ag agrarianism in terms of uh, a black embodiment. And that was actually a very strategic move on his part for um, our to argue for blacks' inclusion in a very technological, industrial society. And so I think that he is very much like, um, I think that, let me rephrase it, I think that while that could be possibly a reading that he was being subversive, I think that what um, Dunbar is arguing about this character, Nigger Ed, is that it's just the lot that he was given, and that if he's going to survive in this culture, then he's going to have to um, voice these narratives and do so uncritically. And 
So I don't think it has that subversive element that, say, Booker T. Washington himself might have had. So does that answer? This is for Thomas. You said that we're just beginning to focus on Dunbar as a dramatist at the end of your paper. Can you expound on that a little bit? Whether well, I do, uh, res do research on him. I mean, as a matter of fact, uh, the play I uh, covered in my talk was published just a few years ago in, in the book that you can buy over there. N not by me. <laughs> in, his, in his own voice. And the point is that until recently, they simply, or the academe, the academic people, uh, were not able to, to find out something on a play that was done by him because there was no material. Um, especially with regard to Herrick, it was um, originally uh, sent by uh, Dumba to, a, to an actor. The actor thought about producing it, finally said no, and uh, there was no reason giving given, and uh, later on, after Damba's death, it was sent to his uh, former wife, and uh, she sent it to an editor of a magazine, and then uh, Herbert Woodward Martin detected it there in 1993. So as a matter of fact, as far to, as I know, there's actually no paper ever written on Herrick, except the three pages of introduction in this uh, book. So in terms of uh, his dramatic work, in the sense of plays, we're not talking about musicals and stuff like this. There's uh, nothing that people could uh, do research on. There's another play that has not been found yet, another full-length play, and there are two uh, fragments, as I mentioned. So in this regard, Dunbar has, uh, is another Dunbar. So we have to, and everybody is invited to just to find out more. What is the name of that play? The other one? Uh, I just have. A, I can give you it in five, in, in a second. I think I it's. That book, it's it's called Winter Roses. Okay. If you found it, if you find it, let me know. <laughs> yes, please. Um. Can I just ask you, since you brought in the question of biography, I think we should be very careful. Um, and I don't know how you feel about this, but the idea that we're accepting, yeah, he raped her. I mean, it's very complicated in the letters. Clearly, he was not a great husband, and some very bad things happened. But you know, even date rape, there's often two narratives. Just a, just yeah. a question. If, if, you, if you look at um, um, what has been written on this uh, case, so to speak, you find letters. You find letters that allude to it, both, uh, written by both, both sides. And to, to call it a rape is, is hard, so to speak. And um, it's a conclusion that someone or that you can, one can do if you look at the letters. If you look at them, you will never find the word rape. And as you all know, they got married. So, um, but de detecting what has probably had happened in, uh, in a November night, I think, shortly before they got married, uh, it very much looks that way. He felt very guilty after it, and she alluded to it. She was injured. Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, uh, we all know uh, those stories have two sides on it, and um, it's a kind of provocative action by me to call it rape, but I, as far as I understand the situation, you can call it this way. Uh, Jennifer? I wanted to ask you about um, the ending of uh, The Fanatics, which I have a really tough time with, and I didn't analyze it because I don't understand why Ed becomes the butt of the joke um, between Walter Stewart in that letter and the lawyer who writes a letter for him. Right. Um, and I'd like to hear your take on Dunbar ending the book with that joke. I, I think that it's about uh, the way in which the North and the South both tried to lay claims to the black body after the Civil War. And so you have one who represents a Southern agrarian aristocrat who wants who wants the body of nigger Ed, and then you have the, the, the paper-pushing Yankee lawyer who is writing on his behalf. Is that, is that the part that you, and so I think that it is, it, he's reinforcing the necessity of African Americans to, of the nation, even as they're being um, excluded from real political participation. 
And so I think that that is what, this tug of war between the North and South, I think that's, that's what it embodies. Uh, Jim Smithers from UMass. This is also for Jennifer. I, you know, was struck by, you know, thinking about, you know, mm -hmm. your paper. And do you think that this might be the sort of the tail end of, uh, of a kind of reconciliation narrative? Like, it seemed like with what you might call a reconciliation narrative, there were sort of two, two competing ones out there, one which would have been basically reconciliation between white and, and uh, Southerners and Northerners mm -hmm. that essentially leave African Americans mm -hmm. out of it or in a sort of subordinate position. But there's another one that you could see in the writings of people like Albert Whitman or actually Douglas's mm -hmm. third autobiography where he mm -hmm. actually goes back and visits a, a dying right. Thomas Ald and there's a kind of reconciliation or even when they listed colored soldiers. Mm -hmm. But it's a kind of reconciliation which involves African Americans as a sort of equal part in this right. reconciliation. And they're, you know, everyone gets together, but there's a recognition of, 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 of African Americans as citizens. Mm -hmm. And that this yes. might be, you know, but this is written, you know, in the 80s and 90s. But mm -hmm. by the time you get to the fanatics, maybe this is a kind of revision and commentary about where the country is at that moment is, you know, that that kind, maybe the older kind of black reconciliation mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. uh, narrative is not really viable anymore. And this is sort of some kind of ironic commentary on it, just like, say, maybe Robert Gould Shaw is, Absolutely. or the second Douglas uh, poem is a kind of ironic comment on Reconstruct. I mean, do you think that Absolutely. that's Absolutely. And I would add to that Elizabeth Keckley's 1868 um, autobiography, right, yeah. perhaps ghostwritten, right, in, um, behind the scenes about her, her life in the, in the White House. And Ioli Roy, I read as a reconciliation narrative. Um, Frances Harper t took um, Henry Grady to task in her speeches, and she um, also refutes him in a fictionalized form within Iola Roy. She puts um, his words in the mouth of, I think it's Dr. Latrobe or Gresham, I can't remember which one, and then that gets refuted. And so she really had a, um, a difficult time with understanding how the North and the South were coming together at the exclusion of African Americans. And her idea was that if, as she says in the novel, if a real reconciliation is going to take place, that the, nation's, the nation must, quote unquote, class hands with the Negro. And so she, she tries to displace the reconci white reconciliation narrative with a notion of black um, and white reconciliation that is first predicated on black reconciliation of the, of the black family, right, scattered apart. And so she, she reinvests reconciliation with a new meaning. And so yes, I mean, that's a long way of saying that I do believe that, um, that Dunbar was, um, himself trying to overwrite those kinds of narratives of black reconciliation as well. It's not possible. Nigger Ed has no black community in this novel. He ends as attached to the white to white domesticity. And so I, I completely agree with you. Uh, yeah, I just want to raise the question of Dunbar and his white texts. Um, because the play, um, the lesser known novels, with the exception of one character, um, have been read by a particular body of criticism, both black and white, um, in a pretty essentialist kind of way. And I wonder if uh, you are sort of at the, at the beginning of this rethinking of what all these white texts that Dunbar has written really mean, um, and that his inability to get um, sort of read outside of the text that people wanted to see um, has disabled us in a lot, a lot of ways that we really are just beginning to unravel. So, and I haven't seen your book, Jean, so I don't know how I might draw on something you say there uh, to address this question, but I just want you know, everybody perhaps to address this question of the Dunbar and, and the white texts. Well, can I just say that I think that the, the, the Fanatics is a very black text. And I say that even though Nigger Ed occupies very few pages, and it is a black perspective on the Civil War. And so that makes, to me, a, a black text. And so 
I think that what the obscurity, the fanatics, is due to particular kinds of paradigms, of course, we're understanding what, what black writing is, and of course, involving black characters would be the main, but also, and one of my arguments in my book is that we don't think of a tradition of African American war writing, period. We don't think of it as a genre within our, our larger genre. We don't think of there being a subcanon within our, you know, our larger canon, um, perhaps a few uh, Vietnam texts, but we don't think about it. But there's this long tradition, and this belongs in it. And so I think shifting a par the paradigm is very, very important in thinking about what it means, what a black text means, what the very meaning of it is. And so. Yeah, um, the way I look at it is um, I think by looking at these texts, you get to realize the degree to which African American writers, as they were identified, were creative and sophisticated and complex. And when I take <laughs> when I take a, a longer historical view, um, I tend to see patterns. So, for example, um, there's a wonderful essay by Mae Henderson on James Baldwin, and she talks about the expatriate novels of the 1950s. And by expatriate, that doesn't, necessarily, that doesn't just mean um, novels by black people who were expatriates or living abroad. But she looks at the ways in which, in a sense, these novels are expatriating from certain conventions, aesthetic conventions, that had been assigned to African American literature. And so she uses that as a paradigm to recuperate interest in, and people such as Frank Yerby or James Baldwin or William Denby, uh, Richard Wright, I mean, you know, a whole series of texts that if you viewed them in isolation, they might seem as aberrations within a, or anomalies within a career, but together they might form a particular pattern. So if you use that as a larger paradigm right, of the 1950s and you think about Paul Lawrence Dunbar, you know, he wasn't an, an expatriate when he went to London, but you have to think about the ways in which that space functioned um, as a way of him thinking about new creative ways of, of talking about humanity. And, and it's through this kind of paradigm that you can, that you're forced to look at his letters. And, and, and in those letters, you can see there's, a, there's one letter where he said that he felt so liberated from racism that he felt white. And now just, with, now just within that statement, you have to think about, well, what is the value that he, that he, that he is imbuing within whiteness? What is the larger um, discursive circumstances under which he's making that statement. And also, you know, it reminds me of, um, I think what Bill Maxwell said, um, maybe a, an hour or two ago, about the prison house of dialect. And that as soon as he went to London, he realized this prison house of dialect. Well then, how, if you were to continue with that metaphor, was he working within this prison house? Because in fact, when he wrote The Uncalled, he wrote it within a, a small house on top of a hill when he was away from reading his poetry and dialect, and he was writing novel, the novel at a feverish pace. So what is the degree to which that novel uh, enabled him to deal with some of the issues that were being imposed on him as the first Negro laureate in this country. And so by looking at the uncalled as, as the first step, at least for Dunbar, for example, in, in terms of his fiction, in thinking about these issues, aside from the fact that the majority of his poetry in majors and minors is in formal English, not even in black dialect, you can see that he was thinking about what it meant to be an African-American writer to such an extent that he was thinking about publishing The Uncalled anonymously um, in Lippincott's. It, it, it got published twice, once in Lippincott's and then by Dodd Mead and Company. In Lippincott's, he wanted to publish it anonymously. And that dovetails with something that I've talked about elsewhere about the whole tradition of African American authors, canonical authors, writing under pseudonyms in the 19th and 20th century as a way of kind of transgressing these lines of genre, which is something I said at the beginning of the paper. And so once you look at The Uncalled in this way, then you find that it's, a, at, the, it's at the heart of a nexus of a whole series of issues that makes you think about Dunbar in a different way. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.